it may be the ultimate unresolved mystery of human life. How and why does consciousness exist? Although some scientific literature acknowledges that the question remains open, the overwhelming consensus among neuroscientists today is that the brain alone creates conscious experience. The brain is described as a genetically programmed computer whose electrical and biochemical processes produce what we experience as thought and decision making. It's therefore no surprise that science headlines today suggest that the experience of free will is merely an illusion, a byproduct of so-called background noise in the brain. In popular media, we are presented with a black and white dilemma. We must choose between reason and rationality or superstition and blind faith. However, for decades, some acclaimed scientists around the world have conducted consciousness research that provides a very different picture. The evidence these researchers present suggests that the brain alone does not produce consciousness, but rather, the source and locus of consciousness is non-material. Some proponents of this burgeoning field now refer to it as post-materialist science. One of the most remarkable of these researchers is Dr. Gary Schwartz, professor of psychology, medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and surgery at the University of Arizona and director of its Laboratory for Advances in Consciousness and Health. We asked Dr. Schwartz for his thoughts on the mystery of consciousness, beginning with the question, how did institutional science arrive at its current position that the brain alone produces conscious experience? Conventional and contemporary neuroscientists, as a general rule, all believe, in fact, they assume that the brain creates consciousness, that consciousness is a byproduct or side effect of brain function. And this is what's called the materialist perspective. It's the idea that reality is defined first and foremost in terms of matter that it's only material things that exist. And therefore, anything else that exists, such as consciousness and subjective experience, that by definition, this has to be created by a material object, such as the brain. Um, and so the assumption is therefore that anything that we think or do not only involves our brain, but requires our brain, and therefore, when our brain ceases to function, i.e. when it dies, our consciousness, quote, dies too, because it's dependent entirely on the brain. Now, that view, which is the current accepted view, in my opinion, and a group of other scientists' opinion, is wrong. And there is a new uh, movement called post-materialist science, which um, – in fact, there was just a, a what's called a manifesto for post-material science that was published in the scientific journal Explore, which was co-written by Mario Beauregard, uh, myself, Lisa Miller, and a group of five other scientists, including Larry Dossi and Rupert Sheldrake, which explains the alternative uh, scientific perspective. Despite the extraordinary advancements in neuroscience and neurotechnology, according to Dr. Schwartz, the sciences have failed to prove that the brain is the creator of consciousness rather than the receiver. There are hundreds and hundreds of studies in cognitive neuroscience and um, emotional neuroscience, all of which presume to, quote, prove that mind and emotion are caused by the brain. Um, however, and I would like to explain this, all of those studies, and there are hundreds if not thousands of them, use three basic kinds of procedures. And it's important for your listeners to understand it. Those procedures are correlation, stimulation, and ablation. Now, what does that mean in plain English? Um, Correlation means, for example, they'll put electrodes on the occipital cortex. Then they will, um, let's say, shine a light and show that there's a change in brain waves, typically a reduction in what's called the alpha frequency, alpha blocking in the back of the head. Moreover, if a person imagines a light, you see a reduction in the alpha frequency in the back of the, of the brain. So the first thing is we observe a correlation 
between conscious experience and brain function. Secondly, you could do stimulation. So, for example, you can, um, uh, if the brain is exposed in surgery, you can literally use electrodes to stimulate the brain, which is ha which has been done. Or you can now use external stimulators, so using a magnetism, a focused magnetism to stimulate portions of the brain. And if you stimulate the occipital cortex, people will report seeing lights. Also, you can in do what's called ablation. Now, typically, we wouldn't do that purposely in humans. You would do that in, um, in animals. But there are natural ablations, either due to uh, unfortunate accidents or diseases, strokes, where particular areas of the occipital cortex are, are damaged. And um, you will find decrements, or if not blindness, in selective regions um, of one's visual perception. So those three factors, correlation, stimulation, and ablation, triangulate, they all point to the idea that the brain is creating consciousness. Now, why is that not sufficient to conclude that the brain causes consciousness? And the reason is really very simple. And I actually learned this when I was in high school and then started out my undergraduate education in electrical engineering. Because the same three criteria are used to determine um, how a television set is working. So, for example, you do correlations. You put a, an oscilloscope probe on a particular portion of a circuit. And then you look to see if the signals are correlated with what you see on the screen. Then you do stimulation. They're literally electrical stimulators, and you stimulate different parts of the circuit, and you look to see changes that occur in the visual part of the, of the screen or the monitor. And then thirdly, you do ablation, meaning you cut wires or you remove integrated circuits, and you look to see what parts of the signal are uh, go away. But you don't conclude from those three procedures that the television set created the signal. We know that the television set is an antenna receiver for the signals. So in other words, although correlation, stimulation, and ablation are consistent with the idea that a, a TV set or a brain could be creating the signals, it's equally consistent with the idea that a TV set or a brain could be picking up signals from outside the system. And therefore, you need to do additional kinds of research, different methods to come to the conclusion about whether or not we're dealing with a uh, creator of consciousness or an antenna receiver for consciousness. And that's why the research that I and my colleagues have been doing on mediums, for example, um, is so important for neuroscience and the brain. Because if the brain was the creator of consciousness – then when a person's brain died, their consciousness would cease, case closed. But if our brains are really TV systems, they're antenna receivers for our minds, Dr. Williams Hiller calls them biosuits, if you would, that then if, if, if our brains die and our body's physical die, our consciousness hasn't died, i.e. the signal hasn't, hasn't disappeared because that was not the origin of the signal in the first place. And therefore, other people's minds and brains, for example, the minds of mediums, could pick them up. And that's why I've done so much research under single-blind, double-blind, and triple-blind conditions, and they all point to the conclusion that some mediums are real and that the information is strongly supports the idea that consciousness survives physical death. And that's a post materialist perspective. Individuals who have experienced clinical death may provide one of the most critical clues on the source and essence of consciousness. While mainstream science attributes the so-called near-death experience entirely to brain activity, as Dr. Schwartz explains, this notion is complicated when all measurable brain activity has ceased. The claim that staunch materialists would like to make is that many of what are called near-death experiences can be explained as residual firing of either the cortex or subcortical structures after, it, after it's been damaged or after the heart's stopped. The problem with that, I call it wishful thinking, is because if you, if you look at the both human research and animal research, it's well documented that literally all electrical activity ceases 
within 40 seconds to a minute of the time that blood flow has stopped going to the brain. There is no evidence of electrical firing of the brain at all. So for people to therefore think that somehow, well, their brain is still firing, it's just that we can't electrically see it. The reason why they're, they're, they're pushed to that conclusion is because they find it impossible to believe that one's consciousness could continue after the brain had stopped functioning. That's because they're stuck believing this simple materialist view. Now, those people have not thought through the issue of the fact that neuroscience methods, correlation, stimulation, and ablation, do not prove the conclusion that the brain creates consciousness. Any more than correlation, stimulation, and ablation would conclude that a television set created the TV signals. They don't understand that core logic. The consensus theories of institutional science tell us that nature and all the universe is purposeless. What is institutional science contributing to humankind in our quest for personal and collective identity and meaning? At a surface level, the material approach to science, if anything, is taking it away. It sees the universe as a material, cold, thoughtless, feelingless, loveless place for which there is no meaning or purpose. It's a, it's sort of order that's that's derived from chance, and it's just one of an infinite number of possible universes, and that, and that our ability to have meaning and to have subjective experiences is really a byproduct or a side effect of uh, the evolution of matter, uh, which is mostly driven by random processes. That view, um, if anything, robs the cosmos of meaning and purpose. However. When you take a non-materialist approach to all of this, which I and a number of colleagues do, this perspective, instead of taking you away from spirituality, takes you to spirituality. And it allows you to, um, to experience uh, and interpret the universe in a, in a very alive, living, conscious, intelligent, creative process. And it leads you to re-examine what we, the, what we experience as the material world. Now, for the record, I love material. I love the material world. I think that the creation of matter and the capacities of material systems is to be um, admired and celebrated. And I think that there are principles that material systems show, which actually reveal the deep intentions and meaning to a, to a universal consciousness, a universal mind. So in other words, studying the nature of matter and material systems and living systems tells us something about the mind of the, of the creator, you know, the mind of God. And therefore, it can be very instructive, but we have to reinterpret what we're seeing um, from this grander framework. So post-materialism does not throw out discoveries in material science, quite, quite the contrary. It celebrates them. But what it does is it says we need, to, we need to interpret them from a greater reality. So just like quantum physics and relativity theory um, was a bigger theory and included aspects of, for example, Newtonian physics and Newtonian theory as being a more special limited case of a grander theory, post-materialist theory – will be an expanded vision for which the material model becomes a more limited or special case of the bigger theory.